Hey, good morning, everybody. Glad you guys are here today. My name is Jared. If we haven't got a chance to meet yet, I'd like to before you leave. It's good to see everyone. Uh, today, we're going to wrap up a series that we've been doing uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts is about the early church, and to the first few days, weeks, and months of that church are kind of in Acts chapter 1 through 7, and then it, it kind of spreads out a little bit after that, and, and we've just been focused on making sure that the main thing then is the main thing now, so that's what we're going to take a look at today. So if you would, why don't you pray with me as we uh, turn there together. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this chance to open up your word. I pray that you would speak and that we would listen here uh, this morning and be hearers and doers of the word. Um, just be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This past week uh, was a milestone for me in my personal life. Uh, October of 2006, I entered into ministry. So like 35 pounds and a lot of gray hairs ago, I started, I started ministry as a 19-year-old in charge of 18-year-olds, because Christians do some dumb stuff sometimes, and um, I was a part-time youth minister for two years, and uh, for, through those 15 years of three different stops, two different states, and, and just looking back on it, there, there's a lot that's happened. There, there were good times where we celebrated uh, baptisms and weddings and celebrations of, of people stepping into ministry. And over the course of 15 years, you get some bad stuff too. You get some people who kind of a moral failing or somebody lets you down or you, you get one of those nice anonymous cards, uh, you know, and you stink, right? Whatever it is, and they put it in there. And whether it's towards you or your wife or whatever, it is. It's, 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 it's up and down. And we, we look back on that, and it's, it is. It's, it's like a, you know, one of those heartbeat monitors. It's up and down, and, and sometimes it's plateaued. And, and what I realize is over the course of 15 years, that's, that's not just, that's just my life. Like, it, it's, it's your life. It's highs and lows and valleys, and there's times things are great, and then things slap you in the face one day, and something happens, and you like, don't know what's going to happen next, and, and so everything just keeps, keeps going up and down and whatever, and, and what we have to understand is that's it's part of a journey, right? A, a journey is not usually a straight line. A journey is filled with all of this other stuff, and the church has been on a journey. The church is about 2,000 years old, and, and it's been times where the church did really good stuff. There have been times the church has really, really messed up and did some things that, in the name of Jesus that should have never been associated with Jesus. And there have been times where things have gone great, times that they've been persecuted. And, and so when we go back and we say, okay, let's go back and see how they did at the very beginning. Look, at the, it, we might be tempted, and maybe some of you who have been with us over the course of this month might be tempted to go back and be like, well, look how easy it was for them. Like, look how easy it was. They, they, were, just, they were just doing everything, and, 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 and it was easy. But what we find is in Acts chapter 4, the church finally kind of runs up in, against some opposition. Uh, the, there's something that happens that, that causes some stress for the very first time, and I think those of us who are reading that today are like, okay, now let's see how the goody two-shoes did it, right? Let's, let's see how well they did all this stuff once stuff started getting a little difficult, and, and the reality is from Acts chapter 4 to today and beyond, the church has had to try to do what it's called to do while being opposed in this world. Because the church lives for the kingdom of God, it's opposed by a world that is against that kingdom, and so are we supposed to be Jesus' witnesses everywhere we go? Yes. Are we, that's Acts chapter one. Are we supposed to share the story of Jesus everywhere we go? Yes. Acts, first part of Acts chapter two. Are we supposed to be, as a church, like this fellowship, this brilliant, beautiful community of faith? Yes. That's the last part of Acts chapter two. Are we supposed to go out and restore people who are broken? Yes. That's Acts chapter three. But will it be easy? <laughs> uh-uh. Not even close. And I don't know about you, but my, my next question is whenever somebody says, well, it's not going to be easy, is what? It, well, is it going to be worth it? And this morning, I want to encourage you with the fact that it's worth it. That doing these things, even in a world that's pushing against you, it's, it is worth it. So Acts chapter 4, let me reset the stage. Peter and John heal this man who's never walked a day in his life. He's been lame since birth. And so he heals this man, and, and this man's like jumping up and down, praising God in the temple, which attracts a crowd because they've seen this man before, and he wasn't doing that. And, and so Peter tells people that it's, it's through Jesus that this man is healed. 
And now he attracts a new crowd that's coming. And so Acts chapter 4, beginning here in verse 1, it says, The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. So we talked about in Acts chapter 1 how Peter gives the very first Christian sermon and sets an un unattainable um, standard for every preacher who follows because after his sermon like 3,000 people come forward and and we talked about how unfair that was but now Peter gets a little bit of payback he gets to deal with what every preacher's had to deal with since then and that's people interrupting the sermon right so instead of a cell phone or or crazy things it's it's that's actually these people. And who are these people? It says one is the temple guard. His job is to make sure there's order in the temple. Not just so that people can worship, but also because if there's not order, Rome comes in and they don't want Rome in the temple trying to make peace. Then there's this group that are coming there and they're called the Sadducees. And these were like the religious elite of this time. So you had two groups. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And even though they were high up, they didn't really get along because they had very, very different beliefs on them, some things. All right, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in like angels or demons or afterlife or resurrection or anything like that, right? So if you ever, this is an old Bible college joke, but if you ever want to know the difference between the two, the, the Sadducees don't believe in life after death, and that's why they're sad, you see? See, that's how you get it, all right? All right, it's dumb. Never say it again. All right, so that is what, that's how you tell the difference between the two. And, and so they, they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, so what's the issue? Verse 2 says that Peter and John were preaching what? That in Jesus that there's a resurrection of the dead. So they say, all right, we've got to put an end to this. They're, 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 this doesn't need to happen. So they, they throw them into jail, and the reason is because it's evening time. And the court of that time, they're known as the Sanhedrin, they they were going home, all right? And they don't get a text message to come back and do their stuff, so they're sleeping till the next day. And so Peter and John, and John are in jail. So here we have that first time the church runs into something. The church runs into something. But then look what happens in verse 4. It says, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So even though this happens to Peter and John, we might be looking at it like, oh man, how terrible is that? They were just, they healed a man and they talked about Jesus and now they're in jail. But the, the other side of that script is now there are so many more people who believe in Jesus. The Sadducees tried to, to snuff it out. They tried to end it and they tried to say, hey, you're done. Quit doing this. And yet, even as they're being arrested, there are people who come to know Jesus. So now in the world, there's around, there's at least, because this is just the number of men, it's at least 5,000 Christians. Because even though stuff has gone a little sideways, the message is still getting out. So this morning, I want to challenge you, friends. Don't stop. Refuse to stop living for Jesus because there will be people who listen. See, what happens in our life is we focus on the detractors and the antagonists and those who are just agnostic about anything that we talk about, and, and we just focus on them. And we allow them to suck our joy. We allow them to deter our path when there are people who are listening. There are people who are watching. I had lunch with one of our worship team uh, guys this week, and I was telling them about this. There was a Sunday. I, I came up, and I was preaching, because you know, that's what I do. And um, I, I, halfway through the sermon, I was done. Right? I was done, because I looked out, and like I told a couple jokes. Nobody laughed, so a little bit like today. Nobody laughed at the jokes, and, and, nobody, and then I looked out, and there's, there's somebody texting, literally texting over here. There's somebody who's literally asleep. I joke about it sometimes, but they were like sawing logs over here on the side. And there's a woman in the back who is having a full-fledged conversation, and it wasn't about Jesus, and I know because I heard from up here. And I, like halfway through the sermon, I said, I'm done. Like, I, I'm, I'm already thinking, like, what is the biggest pizza they can get me? And what's the largest caffeinated drink between me and my house? Because that's where I'm going. I, I'm going to go get that. And so I came up, and I was like, I have to do this invitation. So I came up, and I stood up here thinking about the pizza. And, and we baptized two people that day. Now, if you had asked me halfway through a sermon, like, no one's paying attention. This whole thing stinks. I'm going to quit. 
But there were two people who were listening. And see, that's the thing. We focus on all those people. Oh, they're going to be mean to us. They are mean to us. Oh, they don't listen. Oh, they... And we focus on these people who aren't responding, and we ignore the fact that there are people who are watching. There are people who are listening. So don't stop. Don't stop living for Jesus just because something bad might happen or somebody might get angry. There are people who are listening. There are people who are watching, and they want to see what you have. So Peter and John are in jail, but the church keeps growing. It says, verse 5 says, The next day the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, or so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, By what power or name did you do this? So Peter and John sp spend a night in jail, and now they come forward, and now they're in front of this group known as the Sanhedrin. And we see what they're made up of, these religious leaders, the high priest, stuff like this. And we get some of their names. The one's name is, is Annas, and they say he's the high priest. Now, that's actually not at this time. So he's called the high priest, just like we call ex-president, president, whatever. Not saying a name so you don't get mad. So president, whatever, because they were president. So Annas was the high priest. They still say he was the high priest. Now his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is in charge. But the fact that they live, list Annas first means what? Who's really in charge, right? Because it's he and his family who are in charge. And so they gathered together, and they are sitting, and, and let me set the, the stage. They are sitting there in front of Peter and John, and they are sitting in this semicircle. Now, if you read through this, if maybe you're familiar with the story of Jesus and his death, some of those names are familiar, because Caiaphas is the guy who went to Pilate and said, we want you to crucify this guy. Right, so they are very familiar with, with what's going on. Peter and John would be very familiar with them. They're, they're in this semicircle, and there would be people, there would be two scribes, in addition to these high priests, his family, and his teacher, and these teachers. And one would write anything that that person would say that was incriminating. The other one would write anything that would maybe absolve them from the crime. All right, so the, they would be writing down anything that they say, and they come and they ask him a question. By what name or in whose power did you do this? And they're not asking because they want to join up. They're asking because they want to end whatever's happening here. Because any new thing is a threat to them and their power, and it's a threat to Rome. And if Rome's not happy, they don't get to kind of live cozy with them like they are. And so they ask them, how did this happen? And then verse 8 says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, and salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So Peter answers him. But something amazing happens. Week one, Heath introduced kind of the book of Acts, and it's, it's like part one, part two, right? So a sequel. Luke is the gospel, and then he writes the book of Acts. And what's amazing about this is that what just happened with Peter was told, was spoken about by Jesus. In Luke chapter 12, he's trying to encourage his disciples, kind of letting them in on the fact that it's going to get hard for you. And he says this, When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And then it happened. Luke says Peter's there, and what happens? The Holy Spirit emboldens him to speak. The same thing Jesus said was going to happen actually happens. So in the world that you're living in today, friends, refuse to stop because the Holy Spirit is inside of you. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says the same Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is inside of you. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The Holy Spirit goes with you. You have this secret weapon that the world does not have and cannot contain. So don't stop. 
Don't stop because the Spirit will guide you. He'll lead you. He will give you words to say. He'll lay people and situations on your heart. The Spirit will go with you. So don't stop because God Himself is with you. Peter is emboldened by the Spirit and he speaks up and he says, let me tell you how this guy, and obviously that guy, Is Jesus is the stone the builder rejected. And, and by the way, you all, he's telling you, y'all are supposed to be the builders. You rejected him. That's okay because now he's the cornerstone. He's telling them, like, this is what's happened. Friends, refuse to stop because when you do, you'll have an opportunity to witness to those who have been influenced by the enemy. We are weeks, months after the death of Jesus at these people's hands. And now Peter is standing before him. And if you remember the night Jesus was arrested, Peter denied him to a girl, much less the Sanhedrin. And now he stands up and he says, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he's, he's the one. See, we miss out on opportunities to witness them to some people who Jesus put in our path because we see them as the enemy. We see them as, oh, they're mean to us, or oh, they'll never, they're, they're being harsh to us. But when we don't have, a, what we don't realize is we have actually been given an opportunity to tell them about Jesus because maybe they haven't heard it before. We, in our world, well, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. P- our people are not the enemy. As much as this world, and this is what the world's really doing good at, as much as this world convinces you that people are the enemy, people are not the enemy. People are influenced by the enemy. And so whenever we stand before somebody who might be hostile to us or angry at us or whatever it is because of our faith, it gives us an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. And so don't shrink from those opportunities. You might have a chance to do that. I don't know what you, but I've been praying for the group of missionaries from around here who who were kidnapped in Haiti, and I hope that you have been too. I prayed for their uh, peace for them and protection for them. I've also prayed that their captors would become Christians. Because they have an opportunity to witness to them. And that's my prayer. That if anyone is ever after me, or that, that, that it gives me an opportunity and a platform to, to just tell them about Jesus. And so instead of just shrinking from that opportunity, friends, well, well, see it as an opportunity to tell somebody under the influence of the enemy by, about Jesus. And what's neat about what happens here in Acts is the word for healing and salvation even though it's two different words in English, it's the same word. And so Peter's actually doing this thing. This man's healed by Jesus, but salvation is found in no other name. In other words, he's telling him the same power that healed this guy is the same power that can save you. And so he boldly proclaims this. And it says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing with them, there was nothing they could say. They're dumbfounded here. They're looking at them, they're like, they never went to school a day in their life, and they are saying this. Not only that, the dude's doing cartwheels behind them who used to not be able to walk, so what are we supposed to do? And so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. No, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. So they say, we can't explain what just happened here, but we can't just threaten them with our authority. Hey, stop it. So they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So Peter and John learned from Jesus, because Jesus does the same thing at one point. He says, so who do you want us to listen to, you or God? And he tricks, I mean, he traps them because they can't say us. They have to say God. And what do they say? He says, we're going to keep doing what we're doing because we can't help talking about what we've seen and heard. Friends, refuse to stop because you have experienced God's grace. 
you have, as if you're a Christian here this morning, and I know some of us might be wrestling with that, but, but, but if, you, if you're a Christian here this morning, you know what it's like to wake up knowing that your sins are forgiven and your past is erased. You know what it's like to receive mercy when you didn't deserve it. You know what it's like to maybe have seen Jesus show up in an amazing way in somebody else's life. You know what it's like to see your marriage restored by God. You've seen and you've experienced things that God has done. Has there been tough times? Oh yes. That doesn't mean you've lived on one giant mountaintop, but you remember those moments. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And some of you have. And if you have experienced that, you say, I I can't help but to talk about what I've seen and heard. I can't help but to live in this way. And that's what we've got to do to everyone who's around us. I, I just can't help telling people about Jesus because of what he has done in my life. So after this, it says, after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So let's, let's unpack this for a second. They really, really wanted to punish them, right? But they couldn't because not only is this guy's healed, it seems people are okay with it, well, hopefully. And they're like, well, if we come out and sit, punish them, they're like, wow, the Sanhedrin doesn't like when people walk miraculously, so let's not vote for them anymore. Like, so they're, they're, they're stuck, and they let them go. They keep threatening them. Friends, refuse to stop. Because if you're living for Jesus, you're doing what's right. I know it feels wrong. When everyone else around you says that it's wrong or it makes you, people uncomfortable, I, I know people say it's wrong. But if you live for Jesus, you're doing what's right. And I wonder if this was on Peter's mind, because some time later he writes a letter to all the churches. And in 1 Peter 2, he says, Live such good lives among the pagans that even though they accuse you of doing wrongs, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I wonder if that was on his mind, because he said, I, you know what? Live such good lives that even though if people call you an account, look, here's the thing, people can attack your theology, people can attack your beliefs. But as Christians, we should be, live in a way in which they can't attack our character. They can't say we mistreated someone. They can't say that we're unhinged. They can't say that we lie. They can't say that we do these things. They, they can't attack our character. They, they can attack our beliefs, but they can't attack who we are. If you are living for Jesus, you're doing what's right, no matter what the world around you says. So take heart. And so Peter and John go back. They go back to the apostles, they get into this room, they tell them what happened, and the, the apostles are a little worried, right? Because now they've run into this wall of opposition. And so what do they do? They pray, and then the Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit shakes their house, right? Almost like the Holy Spirit, like, hey, we're good. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. We're, we're okay. And, and they continue living together. They share things with one another, having this community. They continue to heal. And when they continue to heal, guess who shows back up? The Sanhedrin. Because not only are they healing, they're teaching again, and Sanhedrin pulls aside, and they you know, pull the parent move. How many times have I told you not to do this? And Peter and John give them the same answer. And now they're furious. And now they're saying, I don't care that people are walking. We're going to kill them. This name of Jesus is getting around. We're going to kill them. We're, we're going to end this right here and right now. So they send them away, just like the previous scene, and they confer together, and they're like, all right, how are we going to do it? How quickly can we do it? How many times can we kill someone? Because that's how many times I want to kill them. This is what we need to do. And there's a man named Gamaliel who's there, and he stands up and he says, hey, just for a second, wait. He says, there's this guy. He got a bunch of people together. We thought that he might be a big deal. He died, the movement died, we don't even talk about it anymore. And so he looks at them, and he tells them, he says, Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You'll only find yourselves fighting against God. Gamaliel stands up and he says, Hey, listen, if this isn't from God, it's going to fail. But if it's God... I just want to remind you, we're supposed to be on his side, <laughs> so let's not fight against it. Let's just see. And that truth is true 
eternally. If it's of man, it's going to fail. But if it's of God, nothing can stop it. And so this morning, my last encouragement for you in living a life for Jesus is to refuse to stop because I want to remind you that the church wins. Through Jesus, the church wins. Before Jesus was crucified, he asked his disciples, he says, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, some people say you're Elijah. Some people you say you're John the Baptist. And, and, then Peter, and then Jesus says, so who do you say I am? And Peter says, I believe you're the Messiah. And look what Jesus says about that. He, he says, I, and I tell you, his name was Simon. He says, I tell you that you are Peter. I'm changing your name because Peter is Petros. It means rock. And he says, and on this rock, not Peter, but the statement that he just made that Jesus was the Messiah, I will build my church. And what does he say about the church? The gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is why it's so utterly damaging when we Christians walk around like Eeyore complaining about how everything's so rough on us. The gates of Hades will not overcome the church. Have confidence. Do what's right. Don't be obnoxious. But do what's right. Because the gates of Hades will not overcome it. No matter what surprises come your way out of the blue, the gates of Hades can't overcome the church. Neither is that surprise. No matter what's happening in the world, the gates of Hades can't overcome the church. Neither will whatever's happening. In fact, if we want further, uh, a further foundation on this, then John stands before in the book of Revelation and gets this vision. And in Revelation chapter 7, he sees the church. And he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne to the Lamb. And John's new to this. He doesn't understand what's happening here. Somebody comes up to him and says, Hey, do you, do you know who these people are? And John says, No, you're the one showing me this, so who is it? Verse 14, it says, And he said, These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, for, or, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Why? Because the church wins. Friends, there's going to be days in this world that you go hungry. Maybe physically, maybe in another way, one day you'll never hunger again. There's going to be days where you're going to go thirsty because of how this world's treating you. One day you're never going to be thirsty again. One day it's going to feel like not just the sun beating down on you, but every single person is punching you on every single part of you. And one day God will give us shelter. And there will be tears. There will be tears at losses and hardships and states of the world. But one day he will wipe every tear from your eye. So don't stop, because the church wins. This morning, go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends Go be my witnesses everywhere. This morning, speak the name of Jesus. Tell his story. This morning, be the community of love and faith we're supposed to be this morning. Leave this place and restore those who are broken in this world. Will it be easy? No. Will it be worth it? Yeah. Refuse to stop. We can't help but to talk about, to live out what we have seen and what we have heard. Let's pray. Father, this morning we are reminded that you have not just saved us from our sins, but you have welcomed us into an eternal life with you. And it is not just me, it's not just one person, it is your church that stands with you victorious forever. Father, there is a lot that's against the church right now. 
Some of it's just perceived persecution. A lot of it is real. Father, Jesus promises the gates of Hades cannot overcome the church. So what shall we fear if God is on our side? This morning, uh, the church is big enough for everyone because you created everyone for a place in it. And I pray that you would move in our hearts, and maybe today's the day that we start a conversation about following you, or today's the day that we take that step and we're baptized and declare what Peter declared, that you're the Messiah, you're our Savior. Today, we all have a decision to make, a step to take, we ask that we all would do that this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, maybe that's a step that you want to take, or maybe you need prayer or something. I'll be standing up here and be, love to talk with you. But today, refuse to stop, friends. It's worth it. Let's stand and let's sing. How great the cow.